Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, Ambassador Carla Hills. Thank you. Good evening, State Counselor, Ambassadors, diplomats, distinguished guests, and friends all. I hope you enjoyed your dinner and the conversations at your table as much as I. I know that you enjoyed the musical performance of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I'd like to point out that it was the National Committee in 1974 that sponsored the Philadelphia Orchestra going to China. It gives me great pleasure as chair of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you and to express my deep appreciation to the benefactors and patrons, our leaders who are listed in the program, with special gratitude to our eight chairman-level donors the Star Foundation, Pfizer, Alcoa, Tishman Spire, West Legend, Exco, and Yehi Property Holdings. We thank each of you. We could not have a program as rich and as robust as we do without the support of every one of you in the room and our friends that are beyond. And very special thanks go to our two outstanding honorees, Klaus Kleinfeld, CEO of Alcoa, and Richard Gelfon, CEO of IMAX. We are grateful to the two of them and their friends and supporters who fill this room tonight. They and their splendid companies do so much to promote constructive U.S.-China relations. They literally set a model. And I would like to also publicly express my thanks to our outstanding president, Steve Orleans, our tireless Vice Chairman, Jan Barris, our very effective Director of Development, Diane Rogman, and every single one of the wonderful staff of the National Committee who labor day and night to further the, the mission of this splendid organization. For more than four decades, the National Committee has dedicated itself to building stronger ties between the United States and China, and our efforts have never been more important than they are today. We're beginning a new chapter marked by the recent presidential transitions in both countries. It is vital that we continue to build mutual understanding between our two great nations to ensure that we have a new chapter that is peaceful, constructive, and provides expanded opportunities for the people in both of our countries. Thank you. I've always thought shh worked better than the chimes. <laughs> Programs like our Track 2 dialogues on critical issues that are strategic and economic our Young uh, uh, Leaders Forums, the trips that we arrange for the members of our Senate and our House of Representatives, our annual uh, China Town Hall, which Steve has already mentioned, that connects 67 cities and towns across our country, and so much more, are indispensable to raising awareness of the importance of this vital bilateral relationship which is indispensable to 
our decade as we move forward. I have a letter to read from our President, President Barack Obama, that I would like to share with you. I Thank you once again. The letter reads, I send greetings to all those attending the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations 2013 Gala Dinner. As President, I have welcomed the continued peaceful rise of China. Together, my administration and our Chinese counterparts have worked to chart a productive course for U.S.-China relations to address the international challenges while avoiding the historic trap of strategic rivalry between an established power and an emerging power. This consensus has formed the basis of a new model of relations defined by increased practical cooperation and the constructive management of differences. The future of the U.S.-China relations is not predetermined but is rather in our hands to guide and shape. For decades, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations has been a driving force in developing the relationship between the United States and China. And my administration will continue to build on these efforts to identify opportunities for strengthening the relationship between our nations moving forward. With the continued efforts of groups like yours, we can deepen support on both sides of the Pacific to expand cooperation and continue laying the foundation for lasting friendship and enduring prosperity for generations to come. As you gather at this special occasion, I wish you all the best for an enjoyable event. Signed, Barack Obama. Now I would like to invite to the podium Ambassador Sui Tian Kai, China's very able ambassador to the United States, to read a letter from Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping. But first let me just say that we in the National Committee have been privileged to know the ambassador since 1987, when as a graduate student he participated in our Scholars Orientation Program. And we got to know him even better when he served in New York at the Chinese Mission into the United Nations. His extensive diplomatic career includes service as China's Ambassador to Japan and as Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. And we were delighted to welcome him back to America earlier this year as Ambassador. Ambassador Sway, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hill. And dear friends, it's really a great pleasure for me to be invited here tonight and join, join all of you here. And it's a special honor for me to deliver a message from President Xi Jinping of China. Now is the message. Madam Color Hills, Chair of the National Committee on United States-China Relations. Mr. Stephen Owens, President of the National Committee on United States-China Relations. On the occasion of the 47th anniversary of the National Committee on United States-China Relations, I wish to express my deep appreciation to the Committee for its long-term and unremitting efforts in enhancing the mutual understanding and friendship between our two peoples and in promoting China-U.S. relations. I also want to extend my warm congratulations to the U.S. companies being awarded today and my sincere greetings to all the American friends who have endeavored to advance China-U.S. relations. The world today continues to undergo complex and profound changes. China-U.S. relationship is faced with both important opportunities 
as well as challenges. China and the United States have extensive common interests and broad room for cooperation, ranging from promoting domestic economic growth to global economic stability and recovery, and from handling international and regional issues to addressing various global challenges. Based on this strategic assessment of the international landscape and the bilateral relations, President Obama and I decided to build a new model of major country relationship between China and the U.S. based on mutual respect and win-win cooperation during our meeting at Sunnylands, California. To achieve this goal requires consistent efforts from our two governments, as well as the broad involvement and strong support from the business community and people from all walks of life. A wise man changes as time and events change. Over the years, the National Committee on United States-China Relations has made important contribution to the exchanges and the cooperation between our two countries. I hope and I believe that you will seize the opportunity, work creatively, and build a wider and more solid bridge for friendship between our peoples and contribute to the establishment of the new model of major country relations between China and the United States. I wish the National Committee on United States-China Relations 2013 Gala Dinner a great success. Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China. And, Madam, since I'm standing up here, let me try to say just a few more words. Of course. Yeah. Uh, my good friend Steve mentioned the Chinese dream in his opening remark. It is indeed a great national dream which will lead us to even greater progress and changes in China. But I want to tell you, people in China also know very well the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King and the historic changes his dream has brought about in America. And in different places at different times, people might have somehow different dreams. But in essence, they are all the same, whether the Chinese dream or American dream. There's the aspiration of people for better life, better world, and better future. And with more exchange programs done by the National Committee, with more music from Philadelphia Orchestra, <laughs> with more documentaries by Katie Martin, <laughs> we'll be able to understand, appreciate, support, and share each other's dream even better. So let's work together even more closely and make sure Chinese dream, American dream, and the dream of the rest of the world would all come true. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for reading the letter, and thank you so much for your wonderful words. We now turn to the awards portion of our program. And for this year's event, we've adopted a new format in which our President, Steve Orleans, will engage each of our honorees in a short, unscripted conversation about their work and their views on U.S.-China relations. And before the conversation, each honoree will be presented with a beautiful landscape painting by the renowned artist Guan Jun. Klaus Kleinfeld, our first honoree, will receive the painting shown on the screens above me, should be showing, featuring the poem Bamboo, written in the Song Dynasty by Su Dong Po. Bamboo is a symbol of dignity and strength in traditional Chinese culture, used to embody the noble spirit of Chinese sages unwilling to yield to injustice in spite of hardship and presence. And to introduce 
Mr. Kleinfeld, I invite to the podium a dear friend, our 56th Secretary of State, who has played a dominant role in foreign policy for more than six decades. His unannounced trip to Beijing in 1971 paved the way for restoration of diplomatic relations between China and the United States. And through his prolific writings and global travels, he continues to influence thinking on critical foreign policy issues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Henry Kissinger. Mr. State Counselor, distinguished guests, it is, of course, very difficult to follow a Chinese ambassador who speaks English with less of an accent <laughs> than I do. The National Committee, which I greatly value and whose contribution has been enormous and which says many nice things about me, has only limited confidence in my ability to introduce my friend Klaus Kleinfeld. And so, and therefore, my first task is something I've never done before, is to introduce a video of Mr. about Mr. Kleinfeld. <laughs> Just to make sure that I don't leave anything out. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce a video <laughs> in honor of Mr. Kleinfeld, after which I've been given 90 more seconds <laughs> to speak. So let me see whether I could do that properly.
I've known Klaus Kleinfeld for well over a decade. We met sitting next to each other alphabetically at some conference. which gave us a chance to make cynical comments about the various speakers, <laughs> in which we found that we saw things in a very similar manner. He's a CEO and he's a statesman. He is a businessman, but he also and above all, looks at the purposes which his company serves. He was CEO of Siemens, one of the largest uh, uh, German companies. And in that capacity, he opened business contacts between his company and China and got to know many of the Chinese leaders, including Vice Premier Chiang Pei Chen. He, his current company, Alcoa, it's in the nature of things, engaged in many of the construction that is taking place in China in a whole variety of fields, in building the first regional aviation, uh, re uh, regional uh, aviation airplane, in building uh, buses that were used by the, in the Olympics. Of course, in each case, as in cooperation with and on behalf of major Chinese companies, the China National Indoor Stadium, the Beijing Airport, and I could list a long catalog of matters in which uh, Alcoa contributed. But my major comment tonight is that Klaus Kleinfeld has been a friend whose opinion I value greatly. He has been committed to the relationship with China, whether he was in Germany and now in the United States, because he's convinced that the contribution of China to the world is of crucial importance and that building closer ties in the current situation between the United States and China is not only in the interest of each country, but in the interest of global progress. So, hoping that I've stayed within 90 seconds <laughs> and maybe asked again. Uh, I uh, it, want to express my great appreciation to be given this opportunity and to say how much I have appreciated Klaus Kleinfeld's thoughtfulness, his dedication, and his great uh, contribution to the relationship between China and the United States. Thank you. All we need is to go to the have a picture of it? No? No? Just, okay. That's all right. You're okay, Henry. The 90, <laughs> the 90 seconds of fame is over. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're here and I'm here. I'm here. So I can okay. see the cue cards. Very good. Dr. Kissinger, thank you so much, and thank you for your contributions over these years.
So this part of the program, we're honoring the German accents. Absolutely. I'm working hard on it. The um, Alcoa, tell us, it's had an extraordinary history in China. One of the first investors in China. And then in addition to that, it's been, um, you know, the founder of, of Alcoa, Charles Hall, I discovered in doing research, was the sole funder of the Harvard Yenjing Institute, of which I was the beneficiary when I was in college. Tell us how that kind of history has affected Alcoa in China. Well, look, I mean, it was him who founded our company exactly, kind of almost exactly 125 years ago. This is a very special year for us. So we're celebrating our 125th anniversary. And, uh, and as you said, 1928, he founded, the, he, he funded that, and it became a, a pretty strong foundation of an exchange. And it was also his sister, Julia, who actually served as a missionary for some time over in China. So there is a long relationship. Uh, Alcoa always felt close to it, and we have long-standing ties there. We've now put our money behind it and also have established ties with Chinese companies. But I have to tell you, I mean, all of that would n not be possible if also there wouldn't be an understanding on the family side. So I really want to thank also my wife who's here tonight, you know, <laughs> that she has allowed me to travel around the world so many times and also go to China so many times, you know, and uh, <laughs> thank you very much. China's transitioning to a um, consumer-driven economy. How does, and the 12 five-year plan kind of lays that out. How does aluminum fit into that, and how does that fit into Alcoa's plans? Uh, I wouldn't be true to myself I would, if I wouldn't say perfect. You know, perfectly <laughs> well, so. It's not a stockholders meeting. Uh, well, <laughs> doesn't hurt, does it? <laughs> so, so, because, I mean, when you, when you listen to the, um, the, the tone of the new um, leadership, I mean, they basically are talking now about quality growth, and, and uh, quality growth basically means a more sustainable economy. Those are the words that we're seeing. And when you look at the, what we call the miracle metal, it goes right into this. I mean, number one, it's infinitely recyclable. So you mm -hmm. can recycle it again and again and again. 75% of all aluminum ever produced on this planet since Charles Martin Hall invented this industry is still in use because it gets recycled and recycled again, you know. Uh, then when you look at the capabilities of the metal, the lightweight, I mean, we can, we are lightweighting cars so that they are able to go the same mileage, you know, of, 10% more, more of the mileage. So these are all things, airspace, uh, flight, you know, all of this wouldn't exist without aluminum. And all of these are not just visions, but are things that are coming to, into existence now in China. So that's why I think we, are, we can play a very, very important role to develop China further. The second thing is that China today plays an enormously important role in producing aluminum even though the ingredients to be successful on the production side are really not there. China has to import most of its bauxite. Uh, China doesn't have the energy and certainly doesn't have cheap or clean energy. There are multiple places all around the world where it, that could be done. We are open for business there. We have good partnerships there with China Power Investment Corporation and others. So this is the role that we could be playing and we are open to it and, um, and we will play this. Mm -hmm. Which gets exactly to my next question, which is obviously the focus is on the word you use, sustainable development. Yes. How does Alcoa fit into China's plans for sustainable development? Well, that's exactly the point that I'm saying. I mean, you could you very simply said, I mean, uh, China could, uh, could, could use, uh, Chinese companies could cooperate with Western companies to, to tap into large resources that we have outside of China to bring cheaper as well as cleaner materials into the country. That's one way to see it. And then at the same time, upgrade the industry inside of the country to build material, value add material, to bring the automotive industry to a level that is uh, much more fuel efficient to get the aerospace industry up, to get building codes up so that you have a higher energy efficiency. So all of these things we can add to because that's in the portfolio that we have. So I think we are in a very sweet spot. Mm -hmm. How many times a year do you go to China? Oof, over them, uh, I would say roughly minimum, minimum four, four times a year, mm -hmm. you know, and over a long period of time. And, and I, I, I feel very blessed of having had many opportunities to meet Chinese partners, get to know them and uh, get to understand the Chinese culture and get to appreciate the professionalism, the history and, um, and the enormous amount of talent uh, that is there and the enormous speed in which uh, the country is changing. I think that this is the, the most impressive change I've seen in my lifetime. 
I take my hat off to this. I really took my hat off to this. And would you say, in other words, personal relationships, I mean, you're a global company, you've had operations in many other, many other countries. Are personal relationships even more important in China, and is that kind of part and parcel of Alcoa's success? First of all, personal relationships. I mean, business is done amongst people, so they are always important. And I don't think that you can run successfully a company without being on the road and seeing the people out there, see, talking to customers, talking to, to, to communities. I think that's, that's very, very important. At the same time, I think the specific situation in China is that there's an institutional knowledge, much different from what I see in other countries, and having a long tradition. So the learning actually transfers from one generation to the next. So I have had multiple times the opportunity to sit down with people that did not know me. At the same time, I mean, I could start right away from where I left it with other partners before because the institution is learning and that's a, a f absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal capability of a country. And I think it stems back from long be be before uh, the Western world really recognized China well. In President Xi's letter and in, in um, State Councilor Tang's remarks, he, they talked about the new great power relationship between the United States and China. You have kind of had unique purchase as the head of Siemens and now as the head of Alcoa. From those experiences, kind of, how do you envision this new great power relationship? Well, I think. It, the, the best Western book that I've read on this is uh, on China that Henry has written. And, and those that haven't read it here, I'm, I would highly recommend it. And I think that, uh, that this win-win situation that we heard uh, from pretty much everybody tonight, I think that's really a, something that has some substance. And very often we hear it here in the U.S. kind of like a almost like easily said, you know, without much of a substance. But I think here for, for the U.S. partners and the Chinese, this has substance because it truly is an emerging superpower and an existing superpower. And you would say that normally a conflict is kind of programmed in, you know, and you actually can set the clock and it's going to come. But I think that the wisdom that you see from both sides to really find the relationship at this turning point and make it a productive relationship, I think, gives hope to mankind and not just to the U.S. people as well as the, the Chinese people. I, I think this is absolutely exciting and I would congratulate and wish for this wisdom to uh, probably flood into other areas of society also sitting here tonight. By the way, I, just, I did notice on my, on my iPhone that the Senate did pass the, the debt, the raising of the debt ceiling. I don't know how you got that association. The, and the, um, right. It's going to the House for a vote around midnight. But I'm also getting a signal from um, the cue cards off stage that I'm to thank you and thank all the people from Alcoa for really the support of the National Committee, the support of constructive relations, and for being such a wonderful honoree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Well, that was a terrific conversation, and we now come to our second honoree, Richard Gelfond, who will receive the painting shown on the screen on either side of me, and it is adorned with a poem Wisteria, written in the Tang Dynasty by the poet Li Bai, which celebrates the beauty of the flower Wisteria and its symbolism as a life force of spring. To introduce Mr. Gelfan is Yue Sing Khan. From her 1984 broadcast at the, on the 35th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, which, by the way, was the first live broadcast from China, to her current television series, One World, which enjoys a, a viewership of over 300 million people each week. Not surprisingly, she has been called 
the most famous woman in China. So please join me in welcoming IU Sign Khan to the podium. You know, it's rather intimidating to, uh, to follow Dr. Kissinger. I've been having nightmares <laughs> thinking about presenting my good friend, <laughs> Richard. Thank you, Ambassador Hill. I am so happy to see Dr. Kissinger here because if it weren't for him, I probably would not be standing here, and neither would you be here. It reminded me, your, your, your comment about the ambassador's great accent reminded me of the first ambassador to Chi of China to the United States. He did not even speak English. Do you remember? Uh, about 30 years ago, when I started doing work in China, the only place in New York I could go for reliable information was at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. We had no internet then, and this library was my library. It's really wonderful to see a great institution that has lasted so long and has remained so relevant to our times. Congratulations to Steve Orlin. Where are you? And Jen Barris and your wonderful staff. When I first went to China, cinemas, there were filthy, smelly, broken seats, terrible sound, boring movies. Well, IMAX changed all that. It's changed, it set the standard of how cinemas should look and function in China. With 300 more IMAX theaters to be completed in the next five years, making a total of 430 IMAX theaters, the same number, by the way, in the United States. Soon, millions of Chinese can enjoy that IMAX magic like others around the world. In 20 years since Rich has achieved, has been the head of IMAX, he has achieved so much. I don't need to tell you about a personal, a professional Rich, but what I can tell you is a Rich that I personally know as a close dear friend. First, he is a mensch. <laughs> Do you know what a mensch means? If you are in New York City and you don't know that word, I can recommend a book. It's called The Joy of Yiddish. <laughs> this big businessman is a, teddy, <laughs> is a teddy bear. He's sensitive, he's tender, sweet, fun, and funny with a great sense of humor. Being with him, around him, is always such a joy. He's curious and he listens. Every time I see him, him, he bombards me with questions, endless questions. What do I think about the Chinese economy? How about corruption? Where is the renminbi heading? He gives back. He really gives back. He's so generous to so many people. I'm forever indebted to him because every charity I had in America or in China, he supports. He is clever. He knows that the Chinese will pay a lot for first class something. <laughs> he charges twice as much as a regular movie ticket in China. So IMAX makes money and a lot of money there. He's wise, he's very wise. He knows having the right partners in China is vital to his business, and he has great partners. He has partners like Wanda, TCL, SMG, CJ, he knows them, he partners with them. He also knows it takes time to cultivate them. He has logged over 300,000 flight miles and taken 15 years to do this. And he's wise. He's wise to cultivate some of the greatest people as his friends. And I see them here tonight, 
like Richard Edelman, Dan Feldman. <laughs> we would do anything for rich, won't we? <laughs> but one of the wisest things he ever did was to marry this gorgeous woman called Peggy over there. <laughs> he knows that he needs a great companion to support him, and he has found that in her. One last thing. You know how I met Rich? I actually met him in Shanghai through another entertainment icon called Quincy Jones. One thing they have in common is that they both started their humble career shining shoes. This is real. This is true. Rich started when he was eight years old. If you want to be successful in, in the entertainment business, maybe start shining shoes is not a bad idea. <laughs> so with this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in case I did not make enough, uh, com enough comments, please watch the video. Cinema business in China now is about being in the 21st century. It's digital, it's 3D. Everything that goes in has to be the state of the art. And so IMAX is a way uh, to lead the charge. I've known Rich for a long time, and uh, you know he's been a very firm and steady hand on the tiller at IMAX for all these years through, through thick and thin. Rich is genuinely interested in cultures. When he comes into China, he really wants to know everything. This curiosity really bodes him very well, it makes him a really great CEO. It takes someone with a lot of vision to recognize the potential in a market um, so many years in advance of it actually growing to the extent that it has. He has been able to bring a completely new way of looking at movies into China. You have to give Rich uh, credit for his, for his tenacity and for his vision. People in China really are passionate about films. This IMAX experience is so different from what they have been used to in the past. The first time to, to sit down and watch the big screen, you know, and enjoy the audio, the sound. The movie goer really found he become a part of the movie. With more movies coming to China and with better technology coming to China like IMAX, the Chinese filmmakers really feel the heat. So they themselves are forced to be more competitive and make better movies. Chinese films internally are now stepping into the shoes of some of the big blockbusters and they're doing films that uh, really could compete on a, on a world stage. I would very much looking forward to working with the IMAX camera. I believe that it would be a very important factor for the development of uh, my future career as well as the industry here. Sure. Wow. <laughs> Can you make one of those for me, too? We, we have a home version, the, 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 Steve. That's right. The, the, the National Committee needs one. The, um, the U.S. I mentioned, you know, you, you were, uh, you're 140 theaters in China now. You're going to go to 380, more or less, by 2020. Fifteen years ago, you weren't there. Where did this vision come from? It's really extraordinary for a, a media company. Well, it came from two places, Steve. First of all, 
I think we saw the demographic trends starting to happen in China. We saw the emerging middle class. We saw the lack of entertainment. So we saw the pieces that could lead to success there. And then maybe equally importantly, at the time, we were doing mostly documentaries. So it was politically neutral content. And at the time, China was very hospitable to documentaries and politically neutral content. So we felt if we could get into the country with that kind of content, over time, as the market developed and as the middle class grew, we could have a platform to build off from. And fortunately for us, that's what happened. Hmm. Media is not an area that you generally think of foreign investment as succeeding. So why do you think IMAX has succeeded in this area where so many other larger companies have been less successful? I think there are a few reasons. Um, first of all, I think we've always tried to create win-win situations in China. So I think because we were a smaller company, we didn't come in and think we could kind of set the rules for everyone else. So we thought we had to create, and I heard a lot of other people talk about this tonight, kind of win-win situations where we would win and our partner would win. Um, second of all, we were very much in it for the long run. We moved our headquarters from Singapore to Shanghai when we got there. We hired local Chinese um, employees and we made a long-term commitment to China. We, came, we became part of the fabric of China. And I think um, also it was very senior level relationships. As you know, China is not unlike a lot of other places where it's based on trust and long-term relationships. And, we committed to those things. As Yusai said, we logged a lot of miles going over there. And um, it was a lot of long nights, but um, um, it paid off. By the way, before I um, go on, I have to uh, credit Klaus for this, but I have to thank my wife, Peggy, for being a big part of this and also, uh, <laughs> and also putting up with those long miles. And thank you, Klaus, for uh, making sure I did that. <laughs> Very wise, very wise. <laughs> and also, there's the a lot of wisdom in, in that answer, of course, for other U.S. companies that are, that are doing business in China, that that really is the way to approach it. I mean, one of the things that's been fascinating is in 2012, I think when, when uh, then Vice President Xi visited the United States, we saw this change in import quotas of foreign films into China. And IMAX 3D got a big share of that. I think it moved from 20 to 34 films that could be imported, and 14 of those extra films could be uh, 3D or, or IMAX format. How did that happen, and what was the effect on your business? I think one of the biggest reasons it happened, Steve, is because um, we have a lot of fans in China and a lot of friends. So it wasn't a situation where I wish I could claim credit, like it was some massive lobbying effort and it was a push through. I think it was a more of a pull through. So our partners in China are a lot, a lot of the large media companies like um, Shanghai Media Group and Wanda, and they had a stake in IMAX's success. And I think they actually went to the Chinese government and they suggested that there be more of a quota. I also think that um, the Chinese um, entertainment industry has grown so rapidly. So just to give you a sense, there were 2,000 screens in China about six, seven years ago. Now there are 16,000 screens, and I think China will pass the U.S. in box office by 2018 and double the U.S. by 2025. So the Chinese government has recognized, especially as it shifted its focus from an export economy to one of internal consumption, that entertainment is really a target market. So I think they understood on their own that they needed more product and they needed more entertainment options and they needed activities as this middle class was evolving and there was more disposable income. So I think we were largely in the right place in the right time and you know one of the things we put in the video was the consumer and you can't really underestimate the power of the Chinese consumer. I mean I think the government listens to what consumers want and I think they want more high-end entertainment, they want more world-class product. Some of it is being created in China more and more but some isn't, and I think they were responsive to that. You mentioned that by 2018, China's box office will exceed America's box office, and 2025, it will double the U.S. box office. When I think of a market becoming 
that significant. What does it mean for China's export of films? And how does censorship kind of play into that? Well, that's a really interesting question, Steve, because I think most of us in this room have grown up in an era where soft power really relied with the West and Hollywood values and the Hollywood vision of the world is what everybody saw all over the world. But I think when you talk about a box office growing that rapidly, it's going to fuel increases in production budgets, it's going to fuel more films, and there's no doubt in my mind that China will move towards exporting films, because when you have that kind of internal base, you're going to have a lot of money to export it. And I think what's going to happen is China's going to recognize that exporting film is, is a form of soft power, and it is a way of telling your cultural values to the rest of the world, not just the rest of the world telling you their cultural values. And I think, um, to the second part of your question in censorship, I think China's going to have to do a, a little bit of a weighing. So right now they've decided that uh, limiting the import of films or that editing scripts of films that are homemade are in the country's interest. But I think as they learn the benefits of exporting films and soft power benefits from doing that, and they see that those films will play better with less degrees of censorship, I think it'll naturally move in that direction. So I think um, the ability to influence their culture on other cultures will outweigh the short-term needs for censorship over time. With this great success story that IMAX has been in terms of a productive investor in China, what's the single greatest problem that you've confronted in this, during this period of success? I think it's partly um, a reflection of what some of the themes were here today, is that as China has grown so rapidly, um, a lot of the old structures and the old regulations are being replaced by new ones. So you have different constituencies with different views as to how quickly things should evolve. Just like the United States is not a monolith, China's not a monolith, right? There's regional governments, there's local regulators, there's state-owned enterprises, there are all sorts of things. So I think navigating between those for an outsider, as well as an insider learning to, you know, how the system is going and how to evolve is a monumental challenge. And I think you just have to, you look at it almost like a stock market graph. It, Overall, it goes up over time, but you have to, it's a little bit like a roller coaster ride. While it sorts itself out and the past and the future kind of collide somewhere in the middle, you have to just take time and you really have to be very patient. Mm -hmm. This room is packed with National Committee supporters, with Alcoa supporters, and with IMAX supporters. So let me, my last question is, what message do you want to leave with your, to your supporters in the room? I, I think both countries are on to something that's mutually beneficial, and I think it was said in the, in the comments both by uh, President Obama and President Xi, which is I think there's a lot to be gained on both sides of the Pacific through mutual cooperation, lowering barriers, opening up the markets, and communicating and creating win-win scenarios. And you know, based on our experience, I think we're off to a good start. I want to thank Klaus, I want to thank Rich, I want to thank Alcoa, I want to thank IMAX, and I want to thank all of you for being with us this evening. It has been a terrific evening, and it makes a big difference in what happens in the U.S.-China relationship. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Appreciate it.